Today we're learning how to do the Italian tubular cast on for one by one ribbing. I've got a couple samples here to show what tubular cast on looks like. You can see all three of these samples are variations of one by one rib. I have a classic one by one rib, a half twisted one by one rib, and a brioche stitch over here. All three of these ribbings used this cast on, so you can see how it looks. It's a very clean edge. It mimics what we see in ready to wear knitting in the store. This is how knitting machines do a cast on. And it's a little bit fussier to do it by hand than some of the traditional cast ons you might be familiar with. But the result is really, really beautiful, really durable, very elastic. Um, just looks really, really professional and polished. And it's not uh, too difficult once you get the technique into your hands. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. All you need is your working yarn and your needle. So one thing to note is that you'll see I have two sizes of needle here. If I'm gonna be knitting my ribbing on a specific needle, in this case I've got a six, um, I'm gonna be working the cast on itself on a needle one to two sizes smaller. And each knitter has a little bit of a different preference in how much smaller they go. I would, would suggest that you just try a couple different sizes and see what works best for you. But for myself, I, use a two, I always use a needle two sizes smaller to do the cast on, and that results in a very nice tension that looks like it uh, matches, matches the, the rib that you're gonna work right after. So I've got my two needle sizes. I'm gonna start with my smaller needle to work the cast on. Now, one thing that's really great about the Italian tubular cast on is that it's, there's no waste yarn involved. If you've ever done tubular cast on with another method, you've probably used waste yarn that you had to unpick at a, at, at a later point. So the big benefit of the Italian way is that you use no waste yarn and therefore the cast on is finished when you finish it, right as you're beginning your ribbing. You don't have to come back and unpick anything. So that's one of the reasons we really like this, this version. And you're gonna start in a very similar way to a long tail cast on where you've got the yarn over your thumb and your pointer finger, like this. And I don't make a slip knot at the beginning, I just start with my yarn right over my needle like that. You can start with a slip knot, but it's not necessary. You don't need to have that knot hanging out in your fabric if you don't want it. So we're gonna start with our yarn here. You wanna leave, uh, a tail that's you know, about two times longer than the edge that you're, you're making, two to three times longer. So to start, I'm putting my yarn over my fingers like this. You see I'm holding it to keep that tension. Keeping a nice tension on your yarn in your left hand is gonna make all the difference in this cast on. I'm gonna start with my needle, my smaller needle in my right hand, I'm gonna go in like this and just do a turn. You see I've basically just created a loop that's in place of a traditional slip knot or, that I would normally start with. And now I'm gonna start this cast on right away. So there's two steps to this cast on. We're basically casting on knit stitches and purl stitches, one right after the other all the way across. So here's how you do it. You start here, I'm gonna slide my needle in and turn. So that's my starting stitch. That would be considered stitch number one. So the first stitch, I have my thumb yarn in front and my pointer yarn in back. So I'm gonna go under my thumb yarn and then over my pointer yarn. And I'm gonna slide under both and come around. That's how to cast on the first stitch. To cast on the second stitch, I'm gonna do the opposite. So I'm gonna go under my pointer yarn, over my thumb yarn, and then slide out under both like that and that's my second stitch. And that's, that presents as a purl on this side, where the first stitch presents as a knit. So that's all there is to it, just those two steps. The first one, under the thumb yarn, over the pointer yarn, swing out, and then under the pointer yarn, over the thumb yarn, and swing out. You see, after each time I cast on a stitch, I just snug it up a little bit. I just shimmy my needle back and forth. That's just to keep this nice and tight. This cast on can easily be loose if you're not keeping a good tension on your yarn as you work it. So that little snugging action that I do after I create a new stitch, 
I find really helps in giving that really polished finish. Now, the very last, you'll see that if, if, if I cast on my total number of stitches now and I just dropped my yarns, there's nothing securing my yarn. So this whole thing would start to unravel, which is a little unnerving. Um, so what I like to do is cast on the total number of stitches minus one. So if I was casting on, if I needed to cast on 19 stitches, I would get, I would have done 18 at this point. And that final stitch on my row is not going to be made in the way that I've made the others with that swinging motion, but instead it's going to be a backward loop to secure this cast on. So right now you can see, depending on if you ended with a knit or a purl stitch here, you wanna, you wanna see what yarn is that stitch being made of, that second to last stitch. Right now that yarn, that final stitch on my needle is coming from my pointer yarn. So if that's true, you wanna make the backward loop with the other yarn. So if this final stitch on my row is coming from here, I'm gonna make my back loop yarn, my backward loop with my thumb. So what I do to do that is just go down and through like that. So you see, I just basically made a loop around my needle and tighten it. And that secures my cast on so that it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't unravel. And that's super important. So that's step one, the cast on. You can see all my stitches are in line at the bottom here. And this is a nice moment too, after you've put that securing backward loop on, to just go check your work and make sure that the base of all your stitches is, is running in line along the bottom of your needle and that there's no twists in your work. This can be easy to get your work twisted if you're not being careful here at this stage. And so now, before I actually begin working my ribbing, which would be when I switch to my larger needle, I'm gonna work three what we call tubular rows. And this is one of the reasons why this cast on has a beautiful elasticity. So what we're gonna be doing is basically working across the row, knitting the knit stitches, but slipping the purl stitches. We're gonna do that three times, and that's gonna create this really nice elastic edge. So if I look at my stitches closely here, what you wanna look for are under every other stitch is gonna be a little purl bump and in the stitches in between will look like a valley. So that looks familiar, right? Purl bump means a purl stitch, a valley means a knit stitch. So my cast on is telling me where the knit stitches are and where the purl stitches are. So that's really helpful to know, especially on this first, this first tubular row. I'm, in this case, I'm knitting a flat swatch. So the first and last stitch of my row, I'm treating as just a regular selvage where I'd be knitting those, a garter stitch selvage. I'd be knitting those on every row, the first and last stitch. So I'm gonna work my first stitch, my selvage stitch. So I've knit my selvage stitch. My first stitch after my selvage is a purl in this case. So remember in these tubular rows we're making, purl stitches are always gonna be slipped with yarn in front. So I'm gonna bring my yarn to the front, slip that purl. It's a little loose because you see it's connected to my yarn tail. Bring the yarn in back and then I've got a knit. Now this very first row, you'll notice that your knit stitches are mounted the opposite way from normal. So this only this first row, we're gonna be knitting the knits through the back loop. So I'm going through the back loop, knitting, bringing my yarn forward, slipping, that's the purl, bringing my yarn back, knitting through the back loop. And this is how I work across the row. So I'm working the knits, but not working the purls. Okay, and I'm getting to my last stitch, which I'm gonna treat as a garter stitch selvage, so I'm gonna knit it. So that's tubular row one of three. We're gonna do that two more times. Now you'll notice when I flip my work, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna knit the knits on this side and slip the purls. What appears as a knit on this side was what was a purl on this side. So all the stitches that were slipped in the row that I just finished, are now gonna be worked in this next row. And all the stitches that were worked as knits in the last row that I finished are gonna be slipped as purls in this row. So this is actually, what we're basically doing is three rows of double knitting. Okay, I'm gonna knit my selvage. Now my first stitch in the row is a knit. I'm gonna knit it normally. I don't have to knit through the back loop anymore. It's just that first 
that first row where those stitches need to be remounted. Okay, so you see I'm doing the exact same thing. Knit the knit, bring yarn forward, slip the purl, bring yarn back, knit, and so on and so forth. Okay, I'm at my salvage stitch, so I'm gonna knit that. So we've done two of our three tubular rows. You can already sort of see that beautiful rounded edge that the tubular cast sign gives you. I'm gonna do one final tubular row. So knit my selvage. And now I'm starting with a purl on this side, so I'm gonna slip that with yarn in front. Knit, slip with yarn in front. Now that I've done three tubular rows, my tubular cast on is complete. You can already start to see it here. Looks really, really nice. And so now I would begin working my ribbing straight into this fabric, of course, working the knits as knits and the pearls as pearls so that the pattern is unbroken. So I would take my larger needle and start working right into this as a regular one by one rib. This is also a really beautiful um, cast on for brioche stitch as well. Here's an example of a single color brioche stitch that uses this beautiful cast on method. You see how stretchy it is. It stretches really nicely, but it doesn't stretch out of shape. And so that's a beautiful application for this. Um, here I have a two color brioche where I did the Italian tubular cast on with a single color and it gives this nice contrasting hem effect across. You see, I didn't use the gray at all in the cast on. And so it gives me this nice little detail of the yellow at the base. So lots of different applications for this, um, but doing the technique is the same in every single one. And that's how you do the Italian tubular cast on.